Hello and welcome to this session. The title of it is Ideation Development. So how do your learners come up with ideas? My name is Bob Reeker from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I am one of the co-directors of Oat K-12. My guess is you have seen my face, heard my voice, or read some of my posts because I've been very active with the group since Dr. Trina Harlow founded it back on March 11th of 2020. Uh, very happy to be part of this group and to be contributing and supporting art educators literally all over the world. So before we jump into this idea of how you help learners discover their ideas and, and how to best push them to think deeper, I'll just give you a little background on who and what I am. Um, I'm a lifelong Nebraskan as well as an Iowan. Um, uh, graduated from a small college in Wayne State uh, called Wayne State College in Wayne, Nebraska, and then came to Lincoln to teach. And I just finished up my 31st year of teaching. Now, two of those, I'd gone back and gotten my administrative degree, and I was an assistant principal for two years, uh, decided it wasn't a fit for me, and went back to the classroom. And uh, ever since then, have been able to use my leadership in lots of different ways, not in the classroom or in a building, but through organizations. Um, I'm in my second go around as president of the Nebraska Art Teachers Association. I have one more year as elect, and then I'll become president for a second time. Uh, the first time around, I did it with my colleague and boss, uh, Lorinda Rice, as co-presidents, and uh, had such an amazing experience that uh, I thought I'd put my hat in the ring again, and, and here I am uh, doing state leadership again. And then I also was very fortunate to be very active at the national level, uh, where I have served twice uh, on the national board. Uh, first time around was as elementary division director, and then just most recently as Western Region Vice President. So uh, very proud of the work that I've done um, in art education. And um, I know the journey's not over. So again, uh, welcome to today's session. A couple of things. One, all of my experience has primarily been at the elementary level. All 31 years has been at the elementary level. However, I am an adjunct at Nebraska Wesleyan University where I teach the elementary methods course. So I am working with uh, young novice educators uh, each semester. Uh, so that brings a kind of a twist in, in, into my viewpoint. Um, the other thing is, you may have noticed in all my descriptors, I had used the word students. And since then, I've moved to the word learners because I think that just has a different impact than the word students does. And so hopefully I, ca I caught all the students in the presentation and now it says learners and I'm going to try to refer to as learners. I think that term is also important because not everyone is necessarily a student. We have people that can continually be learners their entire life. So just note that Pretty much this presentation comes from my experience as an elementary art educator, but I think what I share with you today has potential to spread out to middle school, high school, college, beyond. Um, you're just going to have to adjust it and make it fit for whatever level you might work at. The last piece on this slide here before I take my picture away and uh, keep talking is my email address. Please don't hesitate to email me, bobreeker at gmail.com. I love to talk to people about art education. I love to help answer questions, problem solve, troubleshoot, uh, any of that I'm wide open to. And uh, usually after I do a presentation like this, I get at least one or two people that contact me and, and ask questions. So don't hesitate to do that. And then as you should be aware by now, um, if you're participating uh, in our summer camp, uh, the first couple sessions, please, put your questions and comments in the chat. My plan right now is to be joining you live through the chat. So uh, throw things in there. I'll be happy to respond, try to answer, uh, exchange emails, whatever it might be. But uh, as we've decided from the beginning of um, Oat K-12, we're here to support, we're here to do it freely. Um, and I'm just really happy to be joining you today as we talk about ideation development. Where do your learners come up with ideas? If you were fortunate enough to be part of the 2021 NAEA virtual convention this last March, you may have heard Jason Reynolds speak. He addressed uh, the entire uh, membership, uh, the entire audience through his keynote. And as he shared, he was talking about how he shares with his friend around his development of ideas and creating. And I love this. And as you're listening, I encourage you to even close your eyes and just kind of take the visuals in as I read this to you. Just a moment of Zen, a moment of relaxation. Jason says, it starts as an ember, a thought, an origin point, a beginning, a launch pad, a springboard, a spark. It moves to a brain rain, 
throw it against the wall. You start to see connecting points. You organically connect the dots. Find the one idea that rings your bell. Open your eyes. <laughs> I'm hoping, I, I just think that's such a beautifully said statement. Now keep in mind, I took that from several different parts in his speech. So it's not like he said that as one complete conversation, but these were the things that just really rang out to me as I was listening to him speak. And I think these are great words that create visuals for our learners. You could share this quote with your kids and have them visually depict what this quote means for them and how that can move into this idea of ideation spoken from an artist. This is how he comes up with ideas. So things like that ember, the launch pad, the springboard and the spark, the brain rain, that's a term I'd never heard before. And I love that, right? Instead of a brainstorm, it's a brain rain. So it's kind of that continuous flow of ideas. You know, throw that against the wall, look for those connecting points. And what is it that finally rings your bell as you're connecting the dots? Just, I think some beautiful words spoken and, and can create some beautiful visuals. Mo Willems was also a speaker, keynote speaker at the virtual conference. Um, you might remember him from uh, lunchtime conversations with Mo Willems that he did last spring when we all became uh, locked down and kids weren't able to go to school. Um, he provided free lunchtime sessions uh, for anybody that wanted to join him. Um, he's also the author of the Pigeon Books, if you're familiar with those. Um, once again, here's a great visual for you that you could share with your learners. Mo said that he creates an idea garden and then goes back and revisits those ideas often. You know, this idea of tending to the garden, you know, new things spring up, old ideas need to go away. Maybe those ideas kind of morph into something new in that garden and create something beautiful. So again, just a really lovely visual. Again, something that you could have kids illustrate um, to kind of show this idea of ideas being generated and how that might be um, through this idea of a metaphor of a garden. Again, a really nice idea. So one of the things that a lot of people need to address when it comes to education, because kids ask this question all the time, is the why. You know, why do we need to learn this? Why are we studying this? Why, 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 why? You know, I, I don't know if I necessarily hear that as much at the elementary level. I certainly start to hear it at fourth and fifth grade but you definitely start to hear this at middle school, high school, and college. So it's always important that we think about the why. And so I'm gonna pose some comments here, and, and then I'd like to try to address the why all around this idea of ideation. So for example, the first one, I have no idea what to make. I bet you've heard that. If you're an educator, an art educator who's been in a classroom, I bet you've heard that from children. So that is a legitimate concern, but why? Why do kids say I have no idea what to make? Well, I believe that for very young learners, it could be the fact that they just don't have a schema built around whatever it is that you're asking them to problem solve, to create, to develop. They just have not developed enough sense about whatever the topic might be. So one of the things we're gonna address during this time is this idea of using big ideas or themes that can personally connect to the child. By doing that, you're opening up this world of things that they know about. So you're not asking them to try to develop an idea that maybe they don't have a clue as to what the concept might be about it. Um, I also think for older learners, sometimes it's just the thing to say because having to come up with a new idea means you actually have to work. And we know sometimes that um, not all uh, teenagers, pre-adolescent teenager adults, um, appreciate that idea of coming up with new concepts, new ideas, new ways of thinking. So that could just be kind of an excuse. So if you can scaffold and support your learners in a way, hopefully that comment um, can kind of be erased and taken out of your classroom. Another comment, do I really have to sketch more than one idea? And guess what? My answer to them always is yes. Now, of course, for me, it's developmentally um, appropriate to think about how many sketches you are either asking or requiring of your learners to draw. Uh, I generally try to make sure that my kindergartners draw at least two different ideas because I'm trying to build this idea that um, you have multiple ideas in your brain. Let's get as many of them down on the paper and then let's decide which one is actually your best idea. Could be your first one, it could be your last one, it could be one in between. 
Um, but I think it's really key. Now, as children get older, I increase that number. Um, by the time they're getting to fourth and fifth grade, um, I'm usually requiring three, four, five different sketches. And I do set a number, and here's the reason why. If I don't set a number, I will still have kids say, I have my first idea, and this is the one that I'm going to go with. And so the idea that you're going to push your children to think, you're going to scaffold that ideation for them and really push them is a really important piece. And you have to know your learners. Do you have to set a number for them? You might have to, maybe you don't. Um, but the longer I'm in a building, uh, I generally will find that kids discover the pattern and the expectation is they have to do more than one idea. And eventually they kind of fit into that. But if you're in a new building or a new experience, it may take some time for them to realize that you're encouraging them, you're requiring them to do more than one idea. And then this one also kind of lends into the last one, but this is my best idea. And so that kind of correlates with that first, that first sketch, that only sketch idea, right? If they only put down that one idea in their brain, they may think it is their best idea. So then what are you doing as the educator to push them, encourage them, um, challenge them to go deeper? And again, today's session is all about how do you get them past thinking that their first idea is their best idea? Can it be their best idea? You better believe it. I've had kids make three, four, five, eight sketches, and guess what? Their first idea is their best idea, but that's all right. They needed to move through that process to get to the point where they realized, hmm, I've exacerbated all these options and look at what I've discovered. The very first idea is my best idea. So hopefully through this brief exercise, we try to address the why. You know, why do children say things like they have no idea what to make or do I really have to sketch more than one idea or this is my best idea. The first idea is my best idea. How are you supporting kids in understanding? You got to go beyond. So as always, um, it's important to, to do present goals of what it is I hope you get out of this today. Um, I'm going to share some ideas with you, and then you uh, can decide what best works for you um, as you're going through today's session. First of all, uh, I would like you to know some components of what I call a culture of learner as decision maker, because this fits in beautifully with this idea of, of uh, learners deciding uh, their idea, ideation decisions, where they're going with their ideas. And if you establish a culture in your learning environment that says you are the decision maker, that helps support this idea that they have control over with their ideas and what they're going to create. I'd like you to also understand that there are many strategies to increase ideation. I'm going to uh, um, share several with you today. It is not exhaustive. Uh, it's just a few of these to maybe get you started, to give you a taste. And then you can certainly develop more ideas or maybe do further research. Um, and some of these are going to be strategies you already use. Maybe I do a different twist on them, um, but I'm hoping you walk away with at least one new idea that you can potentially use in your uh, classroom this fall. And then finally, that fits right into the be able to be able to reflect on all the strategies I'm going to share with you and then consider implementation in your learning environment. What are you going to pick and choose uh, to implement and go into? Loving this image here done by a kindergartner this year. Uh, we were studying how we give our gifts to other people because the theme was resiliency. How do we help others to be resilient? And so this little girl named Nora decided to draw a picture and then I did the writing for her. It says, I'm helping a homeless person with money and food. So uh, if you open up those, uh, that, those strategies, those ideas, and you scaffold for kids, pretty amazing ideas can come out of it. I'm very fortunate to work uh, with two amazing art educators. One I've already mentioned, Lorinda Rice, um, who is my boss and my friend and my mentor and my colleague and all those things that we can list. Uh, but then also Kimberly Diadamo uh, joined us just this last year uh, as part of our uh, community of art educators. We're very fortunate to have 90 plus art teachers in a district of 45,000 plus students. And so Kimberly is uh, Lorinda's uh, uh, co-assistant um, assistant teacher. Um, and she just has really brought a lot of nice supports. Uh, she works part-time for Lincoln Public Schools and then also part-time at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In fact, this summer, she just got done teaching um, elementary methods uh, class that I teach. And um, as I've watched that class kind of unfold in, on Facebook, it's given me some more ideas. But I love what she to said to, to us one day in, in a professional development. It was, we should all consider moving away from being a teacher of art 
to a teacher of thinking. Fits beautifully with this idea of ideation. How do we challenge kids to really push that thinking, those ideas beyond that first solution, the one they think is their best, and to really dig deep, dig deeper into those concepts. So let's spend a few minutes here talking about the culture of learning as decision maker. And I'm just gonna address a few things here to kind of uh, wet your palate and get you thinking about what is it that you do in your classroom to help children to think of themselves as, as the decision maker. Now, certainly depending on the level you're at, you may have to do, of course, more structuring and scaffolding for children. I'm certainly not going to allow kindergartners and first graders to make every single decision in the classroom. Um, that's the, my job as the adult. But as children get older, how are we turning over that control? And I know that's hard for educators, I get it. But by doing some of this, you are saying to your learners, I trust you as a learner. I trust you as a decision maker in making choices about the art that you are creating. So let's go into some of these ideas here. Um, first, this is a huge one in our district. Um, we've been looking at this idea for a few years now, and we've been doing it full force uh, for the last, uh, well, two years. Um, it all started with the pandemic where we decided to dive into themes and every week children would be prompted with a different theme idea. And then through videos and prompts and slideshows, they would be encouraged to create art. Then this last year, we developed four big themes, one per quarter, and they were all used in our art program K to 12. So every elementary, middle school, high school were expected to use our themes to a degree um, within their classroom. And then this year, this summer, we've been working on uh, three different themes, and then I'm personally working on a fourth one that will be an option for people. But these themes um, are, are open-ended open enough in order for uh, learners to be able to dive into their own experiences, what they know, what they would like to learn about, how they can connect to others around them in order to expand that theme idea. What is it that the educator can bring to them through artistic inspirations, other inspirations to really push their ideas forward um, in order to create uh, uh, some kind of an expression around the theme. A uh, good example that I'll share with you right now, the one that I'm writing on my own for K through five is a theme on courage. You know, what, what makes up courage? And so this idea of what kinds of experiences do these children come into the classroom with around what they know about courage. It could be personal experience, it could be through movies they've watched, books they've read, people they've talked to. But how is it that they bring this idea, this theme to life through their expressions? Big ideas, of course, are connected to that as well as enduring understandings, essential questions, because by focusing on the big idea, enduring understandings, essential questions, you drill down to what's the most important concept and idea. And keep in mind in these themes that we're exploring in LPS, they are not art themes, they are universal worldly themes. They are themes that children um, pretty much, no matter their experiences, can connect to somehow. And if for some reason they've not had an experience like that, we just know we have to support them and scaffold the learning for them so that they can recognize that, yeah, they have had experience around the idea of courage. Or another theme for this spring is water, the gift of water. How is it that water impacts our lives? Well, we all use water. We have to, otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to live. But how is it that we uh, help them connect that, that, that those learning, those experience to their learning, um, and then also develop the ideas through inspirations, artists, a whole variety of things. So I am a huge believer on themes, and I, I just think it's um, helped move our art program and our learners further along. It's challenged them, it's pushed their thinking, and helping them to better deeply understand and connect. To go along with that culture of learner as decision maker is the learner as de decision maker, which is important, but the teacher recognize that they are the facilitator. You know, teachers uh, who, who believe that they have all the answers, they're the sage on the stage, they're the ones who have all the answers to every possible thing that happens in the classroom. We have to move away from that idea. I really view myself as a facilitator. You know, I, I still structure the learning for kids. Um, but within that structure, I provide a lot of options for choice, delving into themes that they may have backgrounds in. And what I love about this as the facilitator is sometimes I don't know where it's going to go. Um, we're developing these themes with some structure to them, with the knowledge. Kids might take this a totally different way than what we anticipated. And you know what? 
we're going to let that some of that to be able to happen. It's important to let that happen because once we release that control and we show kids that we don't have all the answers, that's when they start to recognize that they can make decisions about what it is they're learning and creating as well. So as you think about your culture of learner as decision maker in your space where you teach, what is your role? How do you view yourself as a facilitator or the person with all the answers? That's something you need to reflect on and, and review and think about. I think it's also important for us to make sure that the environment is owned by both learners and adults. You know, I set up that space of my classroom every fall and um, I establish some protocols, which is my job, right? I have to set up rules and expectations and consequences and all those pieces need to be in place. But when I have 350 young people coming into my room every four days, how is it that I'm making sure that they feel like they own a part of that environment, that culture within that space? Um, so some of it can be done through um, using, having them be helpers. I have what's called a table leader. They change out every month. And each month, a person at the table has some ownership in uh, handing out materials, cleaning the tables, doing those kinds of things, because they're basically um, support and helpers for the people inside the room. So I think that's a critical thing. How are you getting your kids, your learners engaged in the environment? The other piece to this, and this was hard for me at the beginning, and it's when a child makes something, it could be a, a product they're making for their theme based, what they're doing, or it could just be a drawing they've created they want to give to me. I've allowed kids to start just hanging things in the room wherever they see fit, right? That's part of that present standard. They should be making decisions as to where things go and, and how things look. And so I sometimes cringe um, as a you know, whole roll of tape is being used to hang up one picture on my door. Or a few years ago, I had three little brothers uh, who were from Africa come in and they had seen some things hanging on the wall and they, didn't, they weren't aware of tape but they knew there was a glue stick there and they had watched a child use a glue stick on two pieces of paper. And before I knew it, they'd cut out hearts, put glue on the back of the hearts and stuck them to the wall. And um, I let it go. Uh, it cleaned off later after, you know, after a few weeks when it was time to take some things down and move things around, I was able to peel them off the wall and clean them. Um, but the teacher of me from 10, 15, 25 years ago may not have felt very comfortable doing that. I'm in a place in my career now where, you know what, those three little boys needed to feel some ownership and they were very proud of the hearts that they hung on that wall and I left them up for them to be able to appreciate and enjoy. So by allowing them to do that. Now, did I teach them how to use tape? You better believe I did. <laughs> we learned how to do tape the next class period because I wanted to show them how they can do that without uh, damaging uh, environment. Um, but those examples that I just gave you really go into this idea of how do we allow the learners to feel like they own a space that is really general. It's for everybody to use. Um, it's unlike their regular classroom. Uh, most of you have experience around a creative process that you, that you use with uh, learners. Um, we've had one in our district for probably 20, 25 years. Um, it's kind of evolved and changed, but this is the one that we use where uh, there's a problem that's created around this idea of a theme. Saturation are those inspirations, uh, ways that you help kids to connect to each other or, or into the theme. Um, envisioning goes into that sketching, uh, getting those ideas down somewhere so you can pick and choose uh, what is your best solution. And that's really the crux of what we're talking about today. Having that aha moment like, oh, this is the solution I want to try. And then verifying it might work great, may be a total flop, and they have to go back and, and try something else. They might have to go back in another part of the process. Now, I teach this to my students kind of as a lockstep. We have the problem, we saturate, we envision, we aha, we verification. But I think it's important, especially as you work with older learners, that you need to teach them. And it's very organic. You may not even start with the art problem. Maybe they saturate and get an idea in mind first, and then they have to define the problem before they start to envision aha verification. So you can hop around and then some artists completely skip the creative process and go right into creating. And so I think all that needs to be taught uh, to children that there are different avenues for getting their ideas and then uh, pursuing those ideas in some kind of an expression. This falls in beautifully with the themes that making sure your problems are open-ended enough. 
Um, I, in the past, I've done the make it's and the take it's and the follow Mr. Reeker's directions. So yours looks like this down the path. I've, I've been there. And for, for my learners, that kind of process really does not work. Um, I have taught them and scaffold their learning enough for them to realize I'm going to present to them a problem that is open-ended enough for them to enter wherever it is that they have those experience. And then I wanna see a solution that's individualized. I wanna make sure that whatever they create uh, says something about them as a person, as an artist, as a human being. So that fits in beautifully with the other things that we're talking up above. That continuum of choice, you know, you're, you're probably as an art educator have followed um, uh, all kinds of different avenues on what do you provide for children for choice. I'm definitely on the continuum of choice, as I think most of us are. Um, we can have choice on one end where the teacher is making all decisions, sage on the stage. Uh, your piece will look like mine when it's done. And then on the opposite end, where the student is, the learner is pretty much making all the decisions with support from uh, the adult as facilitator. Tab might be something that comes to mind, teaching for artistic behavior. But then there's continuum all in between, right? So you can change that choice depending on age, developmental level, needs of a certain child or class or even grade level. That can be very fluctuating from day to day, week to week, quarter to quarter, semester to semester, depending on who your learners are. And so to think that we need to be in one area of choice all the time might be um, not meeting where our learners are, but thinking I have this whole continuum of choice, where are my students at and how do I best support their ideas of choice and their needs for choice? And then inspirations have already come up once before, this idea of making sure children have a whole wide range of inspirations to consider and think about as they're starting to create. So in our district, it's really big that we have contemporary artists um, who look like our students in our district. Good example is the young lady on your screen here. Uh, we had an artist in residence uh, come and join us. He's actually a graduate of the high school that many of my children will go, will go to. And so this young lady saw an artist who looked like her with a similar skin color, similar background. And so it was really important to her that she captured some of what he was doing, uh, just made her feel really good because she saw herself in him. So making sure that we don't ignore those historical masters, there's still a lot of validity in looking at um, those masters we've looked at for a long time, but mixing in those contemporary modern creators, making sure all genders are represented, and then making sure we have our Black and people, Indigenous and people of color artists um, also as part of the mix of how we present those inspirations. It is key. There are so many good resources out there nowadays to find those, um, uh, those varied artists. Um, you just got to go out there. You got to search. Um, Anti-racist art teacher is a great example. There are people that have done the work for you folks. All you have to do is go find it and utilize it. And so we can't thank uh, the people that have put those resources together because I use it all the time as I'm putting together my themes, I am going to there and I'm searching out, you know, which artists have been into the theme, how have they used the material in a unique, unique way. And I wanna make sure that when my children see these inspirations, they're seeing themselves. I think that's a huge part as you develop this learner as decision maker. So as I promised, we're gonna look at the, this idea of ideation strategies. So I'm gonna just give you a whole wide range of things. Please choose, think about how you do it, maybe how the way I do it could be um, massaged a little bit and changed. Um, again, it's not exhaustive. So I'm just gonna to present to you a few ways that I have used, I've developed in order to uh, help children to be able to ideate, not ask those questions about, uh, do I have to draw more than one or this is my best idea? So I think the first thing we can do is we can model for children as the art educator. Um, I don't necessarily strive to make a final draft for kids to see because if I do that, they're all striving to get to that potentially. Um, but what I will do is I will model the process as we're going along. So as we talk about the art problem around the theme, I might be creating some sketches too. So I'm modeling for them what this looks like as I'm thinking through the process. And I think that's really powerful. That goes a long ways for them to see that me as the art educator who has tons of experience still goes through this same process. 
And my kids then buy into it more because the person that they view as the expert in teaching them art is using that same method. So um, over here to the right is a mural that I created in our office right before the pandemic hit. I just finished it like two weeks before. Um, but it was finished, but then most kids weren't going to be able to see it. So what I did is I created a video that I shared out on social media for them to see the process because my plan was that spring to show them slides and talk to them about the process while well, we weren't in school. So the next best thing was to create this video. So this will show you how I modeled some of my ideation for them. Hi, Al's Mr. Reeker here. My intention was when we returned from spring break to share with you the journey of a mural, Elliot Office 2020. But as you all know, we were unable to come back together for school the rest of this year. But I still wanted to share with you how the journey of the mural started, what worked through it, all the way through the middle, and then of course, the final results. So let's take a few minutes just to talk about what exactly happened as the mural was started. Miss Jody asked me to paint a mural in the office. The word on here that I use is commissioned. Will you say commissioned, please? Right, commission means to hire somebody. Oftentimes when you commission somebody, you ask them to do a job and you pay them. I didn't do this job for pay. I did it because I wanted to provide a community service project to Elliott School. And I used some plan time before after school. I even went in on a break to paint it because it was important for me to provide a beautiful mural in our office. There on the left, you'll see the picture of what the wall used to look like. You'll remember it had that wall unit with the little doors in it. Well, that was removed. And we still had the quote. You can read it with me. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. So I used that quote and I created a sketch based on those ideas. I started thinking about how teaching and learning is all about using our brain and our heart, but then we also teach and learn through our five senses. So I wanted to incorporate all those in the idea. Well, with the support of Mrs. Deering, Miss Jody approved the drawing as well as the colors. We decided on a color scheme, a color family, or you might even call it a color palette with limited colors. So that way the piece was unified. Then I began work. I started by drawing the image on the board. And through that then, I started applying the different paints. I used uh, different materials to apply the paint as long, uh, along with the, the different colors. You'll see here that I used uh, paint brushes, I used some sponges, and then we used acrylic paint to paint the wall. Some of you have used acrylic paint, but most of us have used temper paint. And there, of course, is a difference between those two. Here you will see how the mural progressed as each part was painted. From the heart, I moved to the eyes, which I made pretty realistic looking. And then I started adding the two silhouettes that represented making noise as well as using your brain. And then I went through and added ear for hearing and then other details to add the colors. You'll see on here that through the process, both Miss Jody and I talked, we reflected, and there were lots of revisions that happened. And that is what's so cool about art is you might have a plan, a direction you want to go, but ultimately, as you look at something, you reflect on it, you end up sometimes revising your idea. And that's okay. That's part of the creative process. Then using the third line of the quote, involve me and I learn, we involve staff and students in adding to the mural. As you can tell from the picture, you know what we added. So several students were picked in preschool all the way up to fifth grade. And we even had a student and a parent from family literacy that came out in and joined us. Our young creators who added their handprints did an amazing job. They followed directions and they really thought about where they were applying their handprints. We even had staff join us as well during a plan day. 
And here we have a preschooler as well as a family literacy adult joining us as well. So this mural really does represent everybody at Elliott School. We made sure to involve lots and lots of people because we really wanted to reinforce that if you involve me, I learn. Now, many of you are aware that Ms. Jody took a job in Lincoln Public Schools is in no longer with Elliott School, but I wanna thank her for her vision. I wanna thank Mrs. Deering for her support. I am very proud of the work that I did on this mural. And then also the awesome Elliott students and staff who are engaged in the process. Because of all these efforts, this collaboration, we have a beautiful mural for all Elliott owls to enjoy with each visit to the office. So that mural will be back, will still be up there when you return to school, hopefully sometime this summer or definitely this fall. Have a great day. So I'm hoping through that video, you get an idea of how we implemented these modeling strategies. Children got to actually see my thinking as I was talking to them and showing them the different sketches and how things were revised and going on. You can do that every single time with your learners um, as you move through processes. One of the uh, standards that we have for our, our uh, city is that we help children to look at multiple ways to come up with their own ideas. And so uh, we explore this idea of how, how learners can use their observations of their world to come up with ideas, how they can base some of their ideas on memory, and then also how they can take them from imagination. So again, that fits in beautifully with this idea of themes. And so basically on the right, I Typically each year uh, work with fourth graders in creating these little tiny canvas paintings. They're like four inches by six inches. They have a canvas surface and they can put acrylic paint on them. And so we usually do a theme around uh, Nebraska landscapes, nature landscapes, Nebraska landscapes. Um, and so I developed this little checklist where they had to create in their uh, uh, creativity journals or their art journals, um, some ideas, and they had to base one of them on memory, one on imagination, one on observation. And then the last one could be uh, one of those again, or mixing them together, or whatever they wanted to. So by doing this, I helped kind of support these fourth graders to think about the different ways that you can come up with those ideas using observation, memory, and imagination. This third bullet, which is connections to their world, just fits in beautifully with this idea of themes. Because again, if you keep these themes uh, and the open-ended so, uh, solutions that you want them to come up with from the problems, you are helping them to be able to connect to their world. Again, it's the idea that you find um, those themes, those big ideas, those solutions as part of the art problem that are gonna be able to be universal, that children can find lots of ways to interact with and, and find um, solutions. So a couple of, of another, couple of great themes that we're using this coming school year are the ideas of what makes a good neighbor. You know, most of my, most people have neighbors at some point during their life. So what is it that those characteristics that make a good neighbor and, and how do you help children to be able to connect that to their own personal world? And another one that I'm excited to teach is, um, can heroes have flaws? Pretty deep. I mean, think of trying to connect that down to like kindergarten and first graders. And I, I know part of the writing that I've seen that they've done on that one already kind of starts out with superheroes, which of course a lot of our young people can, can connect to, but then broadens out to those real life people that we might consider heroes every single day, but are flaws part of their world? And then for a child to look at themselves and think of themselves, how am I a hero? but how do my flaws as that person impact who I am? I think that's pretty powerful learning. And again, can really connect beautifully to their own world. Collaboration of course is key. Kids learn from one another. In fact, I would even support the fact that sometimes children learn more from each other than they do from me because they trust one another. Uh, so I'm all constantly, constantly implementing collaboration ideas within the classroom, probably things you do all the time as well. This idea of pairing and sharing um, or turn and learn from one another are key. Um, 
those are, are ways that we get children to talk to one another, to share ideas, but it's also helping to structure, right? We don't just say turn and learn from one another. We give them questions to think about, ideas to come up with, you know, how do we support, the, uh, support them? Another thing that I just learned this summer is this idea of catch and release. I thought that was kind of a cute way to think about it and get, go to a fishing metaphor. But the catch is the adult providing the support, the questions, the ideas, the discussion, but then you release it to the learners to talk with one another. So I, I think that's a, a nice metaphor and that's something I'm gonna implement this fall in my own classroom. And then we all implement this idea of cr uh, uh, critiques and gallery walks. Um, and so again, you gotta structure that, right? So making sure your hands are to self uh, as you're walking through and, and looking. And then I think the key piece to that is how do you process afterwards, right? Do you pair share, do you turn learn? Do you do a group discussion about what children saw as they walked around? Uh, but making sure it doesn't just become a walk around and look, but what comes of it from there? Because once you start to process, that's where more ideas get developed. That's where solutions, you start to point out, oh, this person had this idea and this person had this idea, but look how different they are. Their ideas were similar, but their results are very different. And you know, keeping in mind, you wanna do this at all different times during the process, you know, towards the beginning, in the middle, two thirds of the way through the process, make sure you're incorporating some kind of a collaborative effort as you're going through. Uh, variations, I think these are important questions we ask children as they're working on their ideas. You ask things like, what if? And then you might provide them some structure around what if they considered this? What if they change that? Have you thought about doing this? You're not giving children the answers. You're not providing the solutions for them, but you're showing them that there are different ways to think about it. You know, children will often come to me and they'll say to me, I'm done, Mr. Reeker. I'm done with my project. And I'll look at them and I say, I trust you as the learner. Now, here's what I'm going to suggest. And I'll give them the suggestions. And then I'll look at them and I'll say, you have to decide if you want to follow up on those suggestions. Now, sometimes that's highly successful. Kids will go back and they'll work more. Other kids will look at me and say, oh, I'm done. And so in that instance, I have to trust that's where they are right now. Now, does that mean that's where I leave them all the time? Certainly not. I encourage them to keep working all the time, pushing their ideas, going further. Um, but I think there's real power behind those variations. And especially in that, when they're in that envisioning process, you know, as they're sketching an idea, have you considered about this? Or what if you tried this? Or what if you considered changing this part of it to, to represent something else? I think there's real power behind that. Uh, synthesis, uh, mashup, I've been doing this for years and years and years. Um, synthesis is something I've always done with my fourth graders, where they're expected to kind of combine different things that don't relate to one another. Uh, and then uh, one year I had them created out of a sculpture piece and then also do a two-dimensional piece like what you see here on the right where she did a lion pop. Um, and then a, a few years ago, uh, Lorinda Rice allowed a few of us to take classes through a company called IDO. Um, and my session was on the mashup method. Uh, and so basically uh, you create categories for children and they list, uh, usually have two categories, could be three, but two is generally you have them list as many things under those categories that they can think of. And then you roll a dice and maybe they have to take number three in the first category and number five in the second category and they have to mash them together somehow. So it's a real spontaneous way for them to get ideas and kids really do love it because sometimes they get really kooky things they have to somehow mash together. Sometimes they get things that totally fit together and they come up with something that's kind of realistic or makes sense. Uh, but it's, a, it's an awesome way to help structure that for kids, especially for those that maybe struggle with coming up with ideas. So uh, explore IDO uh, if you need more information or contact me because I can walk you through because I've used this with as young as about third grade and I've also used it with my college aged uh, learners. A refinement. This kind of goes along with that uh, variations, but it's, it's how do you help children to recognize that some refinement is needed? And as I said, just a, a few a minute or so ago, you know, I'm always going to be the art educator who gives them suggestions, ideas for refining their ideas or refining their work. But then how do I allow them as the learners to be able to take those ideas and do them on their own as the uh, facilitator of their own learning? 
So where are those supports that you're providing to, to encourage refinement without requiring refinement? It's part of this process of learner as a uh, decision maker. And this is a big piece in my district and that's making your ideas visible through your sketching, through your mind mapping, through Venn diagrams. A good example is there on the right where uh, children might create a mind map and then develop some sketching ideas from that. We do a lot of things where we'll do group kinds of uh, brain reins on the board first. And then from those brain reins, they move them into their sketchbook where they create their own personal mind maps and sketches to develop their ideas. Um, I don't have time to sit and interview all of my children about their ideas when I have 20 first graders. So how do I have them make those ideas visible uh, on their paper, maybe through some writing, definitely through some drawing, whatever the means are to really get their ideas down. So that way I can go in, I can assess them. I can encourage them for refinement and looking at variations. Um, I can help them connect to their world. I can have them be observing using their memory and imagination. And through all this, I'm modeling a lot of this for them, especially on those ideas being visible, I'm constantly creating mind maps with them, for them, um, so they can actually see the work in action by an adult. So what do you do with this information now? Because I've thrown a lot of things at you. We've looked at how the environment uh, can be structured in a way that allows the learner to be the decision maker. And then I've given you several different strategies that you could consider as you are uh, moving into the fall. So first of all, you know, just review what it is you've heard. Go back and rewatch this again if you need to, because remember it's here on Facebook as well as our website. What did you see that resonated the most with you? It doesn't have to be everything. Maybe it's just a couple of ideas, but what is it that really stood out to you? Reflect, what are you already doing? What is new that you heard today? Or what is it that you're doing that maybe I put a different twist on it that you can implement in your classroom this fall? Fall. So after you review, reflect on where you're at on things and then implement just one idea, maybe just one unit, maybe even just one grade level. But don't think it has to be this amazing across your school great art program, everybody doing it. Uh, there's real power in just focusing in on a classroom, a grade level, a unit, whatever the case may be. Because once you feel uh, that synergy around the idea of, of uh, helping your children to come up with you know, new ideas, that really has a, an energy of its own. And you can just really then dive into it and start implementing lots of different ways for uh, helping with ideation. As always, since this is going to be out in the web, I would like to do my uh, share my citations. So you'll see some examples of the photos here that I implemented. I just wanna make sure I give credit. Uh, that way I'm also modeling for my learners that I, that I do this as well. Um, it's important to do. I'm hoping that the presentation today met these goals or maybe goals that you've established. I'm hoping that you, understand, that you know some components uh, around a culture of learner as decision maker, that you understand more strategies than you came in with today to, for increasing ideation. And then be able to reflect on those strategies and how are you gonna implement them in your learning environment, whether you are elementary, middle school, high school, college level, uh, working as a community art educator, whatever it might be, what is it that you're going to take and be able to utilize in your learning environment come this fall um, and over the next year? So thank you for joining me today on exploring this idea of ideation development. How do your students or your learners come up with these ideas? Again, Bob Reeker here from Lincoln, Nebraska. If you do want to contact me, uh, feel free to email me at bobreeker at gmail.com. You can also find me on our OTK12 Facebook page, uh, pretty active. I'm the one that does the Monday morning uh, musings. Um, and so don't hesitate to reach out on, with me there. So thank you for joining me today. And I hope you have an amazing rest of the day as part of summer camp with OAT. Have a good day.